Designing for yourself is hard. You don't have that outside perspective that you do with clients, and it feels like you're this close to the work, you know, so close that you can't see things. My name is Ben Burns. I'm a designer, creative director, and father of the year. Five years running. I'm on a journey to rethink, revamp, and redesign my personal website. It's the only project that I've never finished. It's time to get this built. Welcome to Built by Hand. Hold on real quick. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on just a minute. You haven't even liked this video yet, have you? Like the video. Please? We're on a mission uh, to do something. <laughs> We're on a mission to help a billion people make a living doing what they love, and every single like helps us reach more people. So do me a favor, head down there, click the like button. I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last episode, I did creative research. I collected a bunch of great reference material, and I put it in a few mood boards that helped me refine how I wanted the site to look and feel. But this time, the mission is to move pixels around on a screen until I'm happy with the way things look. In other words, it's time to design the site. I know this is gonna start a fight. I know it. I'm gonna do it anyways. Whenever I start a website project, I always, hands down, 100% of the time, start on desktop. I know, I know, I know, mobile design, Mobile first is a thing and so many proponents for, for that whole philosophy starting with, with mobile, but you know what? I just don't like it. You're just gonna have to deal with it. That's it. Come at me. I'm just kidding. Please don't. Please be nice. Every time I start designing a website, I start with the desktop, the full desktop layout. And I always start with two very specific pages, the home page and a blog post page. And I do that for a reason. The home page is, you know, there's a lot of room for creativity on a homepage design. It's also the hardest page to design on any site, in my opinion. And so I like to, to start there and get that out of the way really, really quickly. For the blog post page, this page is chock full of typography that you're gonna be using throughout the rest of the site. So it kind of helps to see all of your type on one page, from your paragraphs, to your headings, to your blog quotes, to the ordered lists and unordered lists. You're gonna have all of that good stuff right there on the blog post page. So it helps to start there to iron out all of your type before moving into the rest of the site. All the keyboard warriors are gonna come out for that. It's like, it's not the proper way to do things. Well, do it your way then. How about that? Hmm? <laughs> I don't know. We're just gonna kind of like experiment with um, artboards and blocks and just kind of like check out different ways to position elements on the page. And then we're gonna do some homepage designs and probably a few blog post designs. feels gimmicky but what's what this is telling me is that like the text is important to me 
like having some some sort of heading on this page is going to be important because that's what I'm missing on this lockup here. And then as far as typesetting the blog post screen, um, didn't make as much progress as I thought we were going to make today. Probably do three or four more options, playing with different weights, um, maybe do uh, like a light version where there's a white background and black text and stuff like that. But um, Looking back that day, I can see a direct correlation between what I put together then and what it eventually became, but honestly I couldn't see that connection at the time. It's been raining all day and I'm just now getting out for for a walk and I spent a good chunk of the day working on something that I don't know if I'm really proud of. I spent a lot of time on the artboard today and what I put on page I'm just not happy with. It's not living up to the expectation that I had when I sat down to design. Designing for yourself is hard. You don't have that outside perspective that you do with clients, and it feels like you're this close to the work, you know, so close that you can't see things. And there's no client to give you that validation, like, hey, this is good, you know? These, these projects where I'm designing for myself seem to just like amplify any of the fears or stresses or doubts. It, it just, it feels, it, it makes those things feel bigger somehow, for some reason. I don't know. I have a lot going on right now. Uh, aside from two little wild kids and managing the team at the future, we just moved across the country. This is pretty much it. Super cute. Teeny tiny, it's literally one corner. And we're building a house. This is my office. And this is above the garage. So between everything in my world being up in the air and, and being frustrated with the first swing at the, at the design, the excitement and energy that I had from the research phase absolutely fizzled out. This is the part of the process, like where we left off last time was the creative low for me. And uh, I, I like it. I like what we did last time, but it's, it's, I'm just like, it can be so much better. And so this is me starting to pull out of that low. And I'm, I'm sure that like at some point it'll get, you know, I'll, I'll hit the hit a peak again and then go down into the valley. But the, the confidence level fluctuates through the whole project. Um, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. <laughs> Imposter syndrome is, is real. Um, there are a lot of eyes on this project, and I feel like there's an expectation that just because I'm part of, part of the future, that means I'm some legendary designer. And I don't know, I, I wanna live up to those expectations, but the truth is, is that I never went to design school. You know, I, I don't have that pedigree. I'm, I'm homegrown, man, I'm, I'm self-taught. I, I learned the tools and the, and the craft on the job. But come to think about it, like, if I really think about it, I actually felt the same way before the future. I used to feel insecure even working with clients. I don't know, maybe this is just me, but I have this, I have, I've always had this fear of being exposed as, as a bad designer. And as soon as I put something on the artboard, or and I, as soon as I put something out into the world, those fears have the potential of being realized, you know? The creative process is, is just, it's always a little painful for me. 
I enjoy the work when I get into that flow state and I definitely like the result of making something, but I constantly question my decisions. But what surprised me is that I'm not the only one who feels like this. The, the personal doubt is, is just the curse of the creative. And uh, I yeah. think that great, great work is just on the other side of that every single time. I, I go through myself, yeah. it's crippling sometimes where you're just doubting. Yeah, but, like, yeah, but I think we are very lucky because uh, at the end we create something. So there is doubts and fear, but mm -hmm. we, cre we are creators. So at the end there is an object, a project, a website, whatever we create. So mm -hmm. we are lucky to be creative people and to inspire other people. We are the kind of, uh, we are inspiring people to change and to do stuff instead of focusing on the, on the bad stuff. Mr. Cup has been around as a staple in the design community for ages. His work is gorgeous and his collections are enviable. And if he still struggles with his, the creative process, you gotta think that, that many people do. But mm -hmm. all the creative process for me is still, I would say quietly um, hard, you know? It's not really as smooth as it seems, you know? It's mm -hmm. always doubts and failure. And you know, there is always this time in the creative process, you are like, this is you know, and then five minutes after, it's I am, you know, because I am so bad. And then something pop up, and and you, you go on. And I am really fascinated by the creative process myself. And the creative process, that experience is different for everyone. And for me, it's 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 a little bit like pushing a boulder up a hill. <laughs> and I think that the the fact that I'm designing for myself. It almost makes the incline even steeper, you know, it just, mm, it's that much harder. But that's what this journey is all about, pushing forward. When I embarked on this project, I wanted to do everything myself. If I wasn't really confident in something, I would just do it anyway, make it happen. If I didn't know how, I'd learn. But if I was smarter, <laughs> I, if I was smarter, I might have done things a little differently. I actually, I hired a, a friend of mine uh, to design the whole website. I was like, you, look, you're a much better oh, designer right. than I, I am. I forgot about that. Yeah. Greg Gunn is a good friend of mine. He's an expert in color and an inspirational illustrator. His work is everywhere. I mean, he even produced a short film with Disney. The guy's a legend. When you're doing client work, you already get this close to it and then it gets personal and you're like, uh, and you struggle with like separating yourself from your work and the value. And there's a, there's a lot to, to talk about there. When it's your personal website, it's literally you. You yeah. are it. You're not yeah. close to it. Like you're it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like there's my face in these yeah. letters here. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's really difficult not to be really critical and yeah, and get existential about that. I think sometimes we just need to know that we're not alone. I don't know. I take comfort in the fact that other people go through the same thing and then kind of come out the other side okay. I realized that I was holding myself to an impossible standard. I expected to pick up the mouse and have the perfect design flow from mine to artboard, and it doesn't work like that. You have to experiment, you have to play, you have to try stuff, even stuff that turns out absolutely wrong. My oldest daughter loves to draw and it is one of our favorite things to do together. She draws so much that she's actually running out of subject matter. So she's been moving past like flowers and trying things that are a little bit more ambitious. I watched her as she tried to uh, draw a house a few times. And each time she got more and more frustrated that it didn't look the way that she wanted to until finally she gave up. Now, pretty much immediately I swooped in with, hey, you just gotta keep trying. Remember, we're drawing for fun and it doesn't matter if it's not perfect, you know, all these dad things. And besides, they look great already. So she listened to me and eventually she had her, just her whole sketchbook covered with uh, little drawings of houses. She just got absorbed in that process. You know, we, we giggled when something looked funny or goofy. She was playing. And the thing is, is that every version got better and better and better. I needed to play. I needed to have fun. I needed to just keep trying things, keep experimenting. So with that in mind, I got back to work.
obviously this is not a genius layout, but like there's just something missing about this. And I felt the need to pull in a display typeface. This one, Vultura, super high contrast. It's got these like funky um, brush stroke elements on the on the ends of some of the some of the uh, strokes here. I just kind of fell in love with it. So I was playing around with this, and I actually did this layout that I really like. Obviously, when you hover over this lower quadrant of the screen, you can do something like that. Background image appears. There's a mouse takeover. The the typeface fills in, and then you know that side brings up a different image. I also started nailing down the color palette, um, and I'm I'm really liking this this setup here. I'm gonna run things by Greg. I'm also really feeling this grid. Five columns. I've got some space over here on the on the left for the for the menu, and then just a small gutter over here and the reason why I'm digging this is because it works for this layout here so even though the page is offset like it's not perfectly centered um, you still get that centered feeling from these two things so I'm gonna pull my type scheme down here so this is something I was toying around with last night is like figuring out how things would work together and um, kind of setting the system and the and the scale in place. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with where we netted out here. This is a, is this a 22? Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty large for, for body text, which I'm a fan. I like it. You know, it's difficult for me to talk about the process of design. You know, I, I, I think it's because I don't design in a linear fashion. Like there's not a step-by-step -step process that I use whenever I sit down to actually design a web page. But I guess at a very basic level, I, I usually begin with the grid. Like I plot out a good grid, even if it changes later, because the grid is really the, the, the backbone of the entire design. And I want to have that in place as I start bringing on all of the elements that belong on the page. So once that's in place, then I start figuring out my typography and I start bringing in color and imagery and interactive elements. And usually the last step is detail design. These are things like buttons and forms and links those small things that really matter to a website. That's usually the last step. Now, one thing to note, when I'm working with clients, I always want to have all of the content that belongs on the page done before I start designing. And that's because I need to know what I'm designing for, right? But with this site, you'll see that I'm using a lot of placeholders and it's because I have ultimate control over the content. So if I need to shoot a new, a new image for a certain spot on the page, I can do that. If I even need to, to cut out an entire section of the page because I just don't have the content for that, I can do that too. And so because I have ultimate control over how the site's gonna turn out and what content belongs on the page, I'm just using placeholders for the design so I can really focus in on the little things that matter. So this part is the same, but then when you get it down here, I was like, okay, what if we took, like, what if we make a list out of this stuff? Um, and I feel like this is a better fit. So obviously with this list, we need some sort of like hover effect. And I was thinking doing like an image load over on this side somewhere. Maybe it's like behind the, uh, the text here or something like that, um, where it gives a preview of whatever I'm talking about, like this keycap set or this, this amazing house tour video or whatever. Um, so I need to, I need to increase the spacing between these, these elements to, to accomplish that. But this is what I'm feeling like it took a while to like pull out, but I'm, I'm kind of digging this.
things were going pretty well. I, I felt like I was converging on the right layout, you know, nailing down the grid and establishing a nice color palette. And I finally figured out my type scale and my type system. So what's the difference between a type scale and a type system? It's a great question. It's something that I was wondering myself until maybe just a year ago. A type scale is uh, it's a group of type sizes that work well together because they increase and decrease in the same proportion. So like uh, a simple type scale is to start with a reasonable paragraph size and then double it every time you bump up in the hierarchy. So for example, if you start at 16 pixels, then the next level up would be 32 and then 64 and so on and so forth. And the scale, the type scale, is literally all about the proportions between the different sizes and why they work well together. A type system is how you choose to use those different sizes within your scale. You know, how big your primary headings are versus your caption text or how big your paragraphs are versus your subheaders. The system is crucial to establish really early in the design exploration process. If you want to learn more about type systems, type scales, and just a whole bunch of stuff about typography, check out our Type 1 course. It's, it's linked in the description below. At this point, I started to feel like things were turning out. The visual language started to emerge, like the bones were there. But I also kept getting hung up on some things. For example, I, I knew I wanted the menu to open up the entire screen, but how I needed to do that was an absolute mystery to me. I, I just couldn't see it. So I have these drawings and sometimes my final design looks totally different. So this is completely the, the opposite of what I created or drew down there, but it's more like an anchor or something. Sebastian is one of my design heroes. His UI designs are literally out of this world. In fact, they blur the line between art and interface. One of the coolest things that I, that I find in your work are all the little elements. So like if we look really closely, at the at the work there's tons of like these little shapes barcodes like little like dials and I'm, I'm seeing just an immense amount of different data visualization oh, where does this come from i i create all of this from scratch <laughs> every time <laughs> i don't copy paste stuff it's it's also not something because what I, what I like is data visualization, but I never take a, when I create this, I never take a look at these things. It's more, more like a flow and uh, uh, go with it and then think about, okay, what does data visualization has? It has bars, it has some kind of scales. It, uh, then you put in, think about elements, uh, components in UI design again. You have sliders, you have knobs, you have uh, um, different kind of thing and mix it up and uh, try to make it look as functional as possible. Because I had this, these interfaces in my mind, um, I did like this. So what I do is sometimes, what you can see here, I use pencil and then I draw the basic shape and the rest is just uh, directly in there. And because there's no right or wrong, so it takes time to design this. So I draw them down so I don't forget it. You know, honestly, I got, inspired hearing Sebastian talk about his process, how he carries around this sketchbook and he sketches thumbnails out whenever the inspiration strikes. There's, there's just something about working in a sketchbook that just works. I mean, I've said it before, but the thing is, is I actually forget about using that pencil in the middle of the project. I always start projects with it, but I rarely pick it up again until the next project begins. It's really weird. So that's what I did. I grabbed a sketchbook and I went to work. All right, here's what I'm thinking. We've got a couple of different options for the menu. I want it to be full screen because I'm a sucker for full screen menus. Um, and I'm thinking something like this. Like this is just a, just wanted to get something on the, on the board. Um, I think we're gonna do like super huge type for the main four options and then have contact details below here Maybe that's like social, the PO box, if people wanted to send me stuff, um, that kind of thing. And then this is kind of like a, like one of those circular text elements that we have. There's a couple of good concepts in here. Let's, um, let's get these designed and see how they turn out.
to explore, but I, I'm really liking both of these options better. It was really at this point where I hit that flow. And if you've been here, you know exactly what I mean. You get it. You know what things are supposed to look like. You speak the language and it just flows out of you. I think we're in a really good spot with the type, layout, and color. So it's, it's gonna be time to roll through the rest of the pages and get everything designed. Had most of the pages laid out and I, was, I realized that I was feeling pretty good about things you know I, I was actually happy with what I'd made which for me is is a little bit weird I don't know maybe I'm biased but I like it I'm pretty pumped and I'm also surprised you know I, I, I love the asymmetry I love the the grid I love the images hanging off the bottom of the page the type really feels like like me I'm happy with it Now, you might not like it, and that's okay. I, I mean, if you do like it, let me know in the comment section below, we'll high five, and you know. But here's the deal. The design of my personal website isn't the point of any of these videos. I'm not here to show off. This isn't a flex. This whole series is about the creative journey, the highs and the lows, the twists, the turns, the fight. You know, with all the magical time lapses of great designs and shiny, polished dribble posts, I, I think we in design culture are losing touch with the hidden struggle. You know, that, that, that secret beast, the looming deadline and the sleepless nights. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about the anguish that people go through when they're trying to make something beautiful. So this is for all of you out there that, you know, that feel weird when you hit a brick wall in your process. Those of you who are never truly happy with the things that you make, you know, those of you who are sitting out there wondering if you're the odd man out pushing that boulder up the hill day in and day out, I, I see you. You're not alone. Now, I don't know where this originates, but I, I saw a graph about the creative process once. You start the project somewhere at your baseline. Then you get inspired by something and you get really excited. And then you make something and wind up down here. And what you made, well, it sucks. And then you start internalizing and then it sucks become, ah, oh, I suck. And this is where most people stop. But not you, not anymore. You're gonna keep pushing because eventually if you work enough, the thing is going to start to look pretty much okay. And then if you work a little harder on it and push a little farther, man, it's actually starting to look pretty good. We keep pushing, 
If we abandon ship at the low point, we'll never close the gap between our taste and what we can make. And it takes a lot of work to close that gap. And to be honest, I don't know if it ever completely closes. But here's the bottom line. You'll never create anything great if you never create anything at all. Whew. <laughs> uh, okay, well, that got a little deep. <laughs> I, I watched The Gap by Ira Glass today and I got all fired up, so... Next time! <laughs> Next episode, we're gonna be moving into the development phase. This is where we take our designs and we make them real. They become an actual website that you can interact with. And spoiler alert, I am not an engineer. Not even close. Let me ask you, can you relate to the ups and downs of this creative process? Or are you one of those lucky ones who sits down and just makes magic happen? Because if so, you need to leave. No. <laughs> Let me know in the comment section below. Let's talk about it. Now, once again, I am not here to tell you how to do things. I'm simply sharing my journey. There are better designers and engineers out there who you can learn from. Just pick up what you need, leave what you don't. Find the process that works for you. Oh, and by the way, before you ask, I'm talking to you, Figma fanboys. I like Figma. I really do. I've used it. We've used it on projects. I'm just more comfortable in XD. That's it. And guys, they're just tools. They are just tools. So I don't want to see you in the chat preaching Figma. I like XD, okay? But that's it. There's no, they're both good. Just get, just stop, please. All right, guys, time for you to get back to work. You got this, go out there and crush it. Remember, we love you and I'll see you next time.